Is that a saying anymore, old fogey? <laughs> All right, well, now you learn something new today. So, um, But on a serious level, I want, I want to get on that level with you guys tonight because I wouldn't be up here speaking to you if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. And I mean that's in the depths of my heart, and you'll learn a little bit more about why I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. So I'll start my story where you guys are at now. When I got into middle school, that's when things started falling apart for me. Um, it's not just crazy hormones that y'all going through with middle school. Some of you are coming from broken families. I know my family was breaking during that time for me. And that was a very tough, difficult thing to go through. And for me, I looked for distractions and I looked for things to fill that pain that I was going through as my family was being ripped apart. Uh, when I got to middle school, that's, that's when I started getting into alcohol and other kind of drugs, um, mostly prescription drugs because that was easy access for me because my father was on Vicodin. So uh, that was something I could snatch from the cover real fast. Um, and the reason I did that is because I was in so much pain. And it's not just because my family was splitting apart. Is because I, I was missing something in my life that my father and mother couldn't give me, that any girl in a relationship could give me, that any drug could give me, any kind of music could give me. And that's what I was searching for because I, I, I didn't feel like there was much meaning to life. I kind of was a more deep thinker. I always had those questions. What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? Um, stuff that you can go round and round about for a long period of time. So, so when I was in middle school, that, that's kind of where I was at. Friends were my biggest distraction. I would, they were my family. My friends were my family. And a lot of you guys probably feel like that too. You, and I see you guys looking. <laughs> you my sister. You my brother. I got it. But it's true. Because if you feel like that already at home, and you're looking for that stuff to fill you, you're looking to have a relationship, right? Ultimately, it comes back down to relationships is what we're looking for, some kind of relationship to fulfill us. So I don't wanna, I wanna dwell on that too long. Like I said, I'm an old fogey, so uh, usually I'm sleeping by now. <laughs> I had a lot of coffee today just, just for you guys. Um, Okay, so junior high is where it began. High school is where things really started happening for me in a bad way, not a good way. Uh, a lot of those friends that I was hanging out with and that you know I, I had were uh, always in trouble. 
Um, I was a bit of a troublemaker, so I was always getting Saturday detentions. I was always getting suspended. I wouldn't call myself uh, a very angry, mean person by any, you know, I didn't go and like pick fights or bully anybody, but I did some stupid stuff, and that was my way of kind of distracting myself and and getting away from my own thoughts. Because when I sat in my own thoughts when I was alone, that was prison for me. When I sat alone and I could dwell on the pain that I was going through and the hopelessness of what was the reason to live for, that's when things started getting real for me. And the only way to escape that pain in my mind, in my thoughts, was to escape it on my wrist. So cutting became something that was part of my daily routine to distract me, to get me out of that pain I was in. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to my sophomore year of high school. Um, I had a buddy that I was really close with. We got in a lot of trouble together. I was constantly at his house. Um, and we liked to go to the store and, and steal liquor. That was like one of our, our things that we did. Um, but it really came down to uh, a, a relationship. At this point in my life, through uh, dating girls and stuff and being cheated on and being broken up with and, and just funneling through relationships, um, that's, that was like my last hope. I was trying to find that special somebody that I could fall in love with and everything would be good and that person would fulfill me. That's what I was looking for. It wasn't about sex for me or anything like that. It was literally about I wanted to be fulfilled. I wanted somebody to love me in that way. And I wanted to be able to love somebody and they know, know that they're loved too and be mutual. That, it was deeper for me. So, so here's where the story begins. Me and my friend start talking to a couple girls that were in junior high. We were in high school, so we're about two or three years older. Yeah, I know. I see, I see your face. They're like, well, what's wrong with you, man? Um, there's a lot wrong with me. That's what you're finding out right now, right? <laughs> All right. So she was eighth grade. I was in 10th grade. I never met her. I never saw a picture of her. Well, okay, I did see a picture of her on, like, I think it was Facebook. No, MySpace. Oh, yeah, MySpace. Um, we started talking over the phone. My friend was talking to her best friend, and we we're, you know, going to hook up with them and have a relationship and date and all that. So after about two weeks of talking with this girl, I was in love with her. Like, I was, this was the one, this was the one that was going to fulfill me. This is the one I was going to be with the rest of my life. Again, 10th grade. 10th grade, y'all. Some of you are thinking like that, though. So it's not to make fun. But when you look back, you make fun of yourself. Um, so leading up to that, we were going to go to the movies, right? Because in Ashtabula, you don't have much to do, except maybe go to the movies on Friday night. And the mall actually was happening back then. So uh, imagine, I, I can't imagine now what it's like for you guys uh, with a dead mall. Um, so yeah, so we were getting ready to go. It was, the, it was the night of, two hours beforehand. We find out they're not allowed to go. I'm like, okay, what the heck happened? You know, like I've been anticipating this. I'm gonna, this is my future wife or whatever that I'm gonna meet tonight. Everything's going to be good. All the pain's going to go away. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, come to find out, not only was she not allowed to come that night, she was never allowed to contact me again. And I had no idea why. So, through some investigation, my friend, who was trying to hook up with her friend, brother, you with me? I know this was his friend. He should friend sit with that cousin. Okay. Her brother liked the girl that I liked. My name was pretty well known as a troublemaker. So he used that, and he told her parents about me and, and all this stuff about me and how I'm bad news and that, because he liked her. I was shattered. I mean, I know it sound, it may, when I think of it, it sounds stupid, but then and where you guys are at now, it's not. It's real, and it's deep. And for me, that's how it was, because like I said, if this was the rope and this is the end of the rope, I was kind of past it already for me. 
So I, I was riding everything on this relationship with this girl. I wake up the next morning, get on the school bus like I usually do. Had a little bit of vodka left in my backpack. And uh, I was very deep into the band Korn. I don't know if anybody listened to Korn or heard of them, but they're a metal band. And uh, they got some very dark lyrics and dark songs, and, but it was something that I could identify with because it was mostly about pain. And as I was on the bus and had my headphones on, just broken and angry, I was listening to this song on repeat called Falling Away From Me. And as I drank, the more I got buzzed, the more I started feeling like I was kind of losing myself a bit. And that kind of helped push me into the next thing that I did. So I get to school, and I'm looking for this kid. I've never met this kid before. I don't know. I know what he looks like now because I looked him up on MySpace. Um, but he was going to pay. He ruined my life. He ruined my life, so he was going to pay for it. Next thing I know, as I'm looking and I'm asking people, where's he at? I got a crowd behind me because you know how everybody likes a good fight. I finally found him in the hall of Edgewood Senior High School. My first initial thing was I'm going to drag him into the bathroom because I'm going to beat him up. Nobody's going to know it, and I won't be in trouble. <laughs> Obviously, that didn't happen. I went to grab him by his shirt, and I said, you're done, man. Like, you're coming with me. Like, you ruined my life. I'm going to ruin you. And he knocked my hand off his shoulder, and he swung at me. And somehow in my drunken fight stance, I dodged his punch. I hit him, and the hitting did not stop. I have never been that person to go and hurt somebody like that. I might joke around with people and make fun, but I'd, I'd, I'd never been like that in my life before. So this was uncharacteristic for me, but all that pain, that monster that was inside that was building over time, it finally came out. A little bit of alcohol, a little bit of music really helped push that. And I was just kept on hitting him over and over, and he wasn't even able to defend himself or anything. And finally, Mr. Malak, at that time, he was our vice principal, he came over and uh, put me in a chokehold, and he's a pretty big guy, so there's really no struggle with him. Um, at that point, I just started walking down to his office, because I knew that's where we were heading. And I get down to that office, and I sit down, and I break down into tears. Again, all this pain, all this misery I've been going through for years that has been building up, it came out, and it came out very ugly. And as I sat across from this kid, not five feet from me with black eyes and swollen lip, I said, dude, I'm sorry. I don't know what I've become. And this is what got me. He said, I forgive you, man after I just beat, beat him. He says, I forgive you, man. That made me feel even more like a monster. That struck me so hard. That was it for me. It's like, not only do I have no reason to live in this world, because everything I tried to fill my life with made me more empty. I become a monster, and I hurt other people. I didn't want to live anymore. That's what pushed it for me. The pain, the risk cutting, it became more than that now. It became a plan to end my life. And as I was in that three day suspension, how would I do it? Do I take a belt? Do I hang myself? Do I take the rest of my dad's pills? Do I slice my wrist and just let myself bleed out? And my mother, being the Christian woman she is, her punishment for me was to go with the youth group to a youth event. Let me tell you something. That was the last thing I wanted to do, was go to a church and hear that crap, because that's what it was to me at that point. I didn't mention I grew up in the church. 
I've said the sinner's prayer multiple times by then. That makes you a Christian, right? Saying a prayer, and you're good to go, magic words, and you're a Christian, and you're good. So keep that in mind. So here I am Friday night going to Cleveland with my youth group. I didn't want to talk to any of them. They tried talking to me. I didn't have nothing to do with them all night long. Get into the event, worship music playing, you know, the routine. All I could think about is when I get home, how am I going to do it? How am I going to end this because I don't want to live anymore? There is no reason for me to live. This life sucks. I don't want to live anymore. And then some guy got on and started talking in the microphone. And it sounded like my life story was being talked back to me. It had my attention. A fella saying, he used to be an alcohol. He used to be suicidal. And then he talks about Jesus. And I know Jesus. I know about Jesus. I don't know Jesus, but I know about him. Trust me, I could quote scripture verse all day long to you. I grew up in the church. I went through the motions. But identifying with his pain, identifying with everything he went through, is the same thing I went through. And I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one in the world going through what I was going through. And it was like this guy was speaking about me to me. And I can't tell you the grab on my heart it's something that you can't explain. I tried, but there was something that felt like a hand on my heart grabbing it. And I knew this was it. I know Jesus is real. I believe that, but I didn't want anything to do with him. That night, that's when I got real with God. I said, Jesus, if you are real, change me. Make me a different person. I will serve you. I'll do whatever you want. But if you're not real and you don't change me, I'm done. When I go home, done. I'm out of this world. There is a cross just like this, except about 50 feet tall, and this huge thousands of people watching arena. And before the guy was even done talking, I ran up there. And those were the words I was saying as I wept. I don't know how to explain if, if anybody's ever had weight just put on them physically. There's a, a, an emotional, spiritual weight that we all carry around. And that was lifted off me. I never felt so light before. I felt like I was kind of just floating and I felt a peace and a joy that I haven't felt my whole life. All I knew was darkness. All I knew was death because that's all I contemplated. I didn't know life. I didn't know him. Even people who think they know life, they don't know life unless they know him because he is life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. That night I was changed. That was 2004. That was a little bit ago. And I've never been the same since. The Bible says that he'll make you a new creation. He'll put his spirit inside you and give you new and right desires. I don't have a desire to kill myself anymore. I don't have a desire to hurt people even when they hurt me. So I come back to school that Monday. Actually, back up. I come home that weekend. And I just let it all out to my parents because I wanted to tell them how awesome my weekend was because I didn't want to kill myself. And I told them everything. I told them every drug I took. I told them every alcohol bottle I stole, every slice on my wrist. And they couldn't believe it. <laughs> My kids telling me all these things, they didn't know. They knew something was wrong with me, but they didn't know that that was going on with me. My dad thought I was making it up. 
just to get out of trouble. Like, that's how unreal the change was with me. That it was almost unbelievable. So now I'm coming back to school. All my friends, all I want to do is tell them about Jesus. How can I shut up about Jesus Christ when he saved me from death? How can I not tell them that this God of love who took all the punishment on that cross, who took every ounce of pain that you have and bled it out on the cross, how can I not tell people about this? It's like having the cure for cancer and withholding it from people who have cancer. You don't do that. If you love them, you tell them. And that's why I'm up here telling you guys now. So I went to school. My friends didn't know what to do with me. They are like, dude, stay away from me. Like, screw you. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with that. That was one of, again, the biggest things I tried to fill my life with was friends. And honestly, when I became a Christian, I was like, God, I ain't going to have no friends. But let me tell you something. God is awesome. I had more friends than I could ever imagine. I, I met awesome Pastor Mike back here 12, 12 years ago. I met so many awesome people full of God's love that are with you through it, that want to be there with you. And that, that's something. That's what it's all about, being part of the family, right? It's not just about coming to church, clapping your hands, going through the motions. That doesn't do anything. That's crap. People can see through that. Anybody who has a brain can see when it's crap or when it's real. So I had more friends than I could ever imagine. God took all the things that I worried about and he blessed me more than I could ever imagine. And I don't want to go too deep into blessings in that because guess what? Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean life isn't hard. That's a lie. If somebody tells you that, they're full of crap. Don't believe it. But we'll, we'll get to that. So I couldn't keep myself out of the Bible after that. I wanted to know God so much. Like, I was at lunchtime reading my Bible, and people come up to me like, dude, what are you reading for? Like, that's dumb. And I was like, man, this stuff is not dumb. Let me tell you about it. Most of them, you know, like, eh, don't tell me about that. <laughs> um, but then some people did. And I got to share this story that I'm sharing with you with them. And found out we're not so different after all because a lot of them were going through the same stuff I went through. And they didn't know about this awesome Savior who wanted to fill them with his love and his spirit and pull them from the pit of hell. Yes, worship team. There's a song that they're going to play that is very deep. And I want you guys to listen to the words to it. And here's the thing. Jesus meets you where you're at. You can be in church. You can be in at, a, at an event. You can be in your bedroom. God's going to meet you wherever you want him to meet you at. But tonight, that's opportunity. I know some of you are yawning out there, and that's okay, because I know God is, is working in your life. Because all those times I prayed that prayer and nothing changed, there was things being planted in my soul that I didn't know were going to come forth. But I want you guys to know that we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Some of us are planning on not guaranteeing tomorrow like I was. Some of us will walk out of here and never make it home. We think we're invincible. That's a lie. We're not. We think we have control over our lives. We have no control. We have an illusion of control. And I challenge you guys tonight, 
if this story was resonating with you of my life, Jesus takes you as you are. You don't clean up first and come to him. I was a very filthy person when I met Jesus Christ. He took me as I was when probably nobody else would in this world take me that way. It's between you and him. It's not between anybody else. It's just you and God. There's no formula. There's no special prayer with empty words that is going to save you. Your genuine heart cry to him and inviting him into your life. That's what's going to save you. So tonight you have that opportunity anytime tonight, not just now. It's got to be made by you though. It's got to be something that you want. But like I said, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. That's not to scare you, that's reality. We put on things as masks to distract ourselves or to seem okay. Nobody knew I was suicidal. Nobody knew I was depressed and cutting myself. My face never, never told that story to anybody else. But if you could see my face inside me, it was crying out in agony all the time. I knew I was a sinner. I knew that I broke God's law because we all have. That's why he came. That God himself would come as us, as men, take our punishment so that we may have life in him. Not only that, he gives us his spirit. It's something that maybe we can't understand right away, but it's a walk, it's a journey, it's a relationship with the creator of the universe, with the one who died for you. He took your place. All you have to do is accept that. Give it all to Him and He'll give you all of Him. It's not complicated. It's got to be genuine though. So as we sing these words tonight, search your hearts. Think about what I said tonight. And let that be between you and God. Like I said, He'll meet you where you're at. Even though I don't know you guys personally, I can say that I love you because he loves you. And he's put that love in me. And that's what it's all about. I'll be up here to pray with you, to talk with you, anything you want. I'm here. You just let me know. Go ahead and sing this song.
I'm just going to take a second to pray with you guys. Thank you for having me out tonight. It's a privilege to be before all of you. And I hope to get to know each and every one of you. But more importantly, I hope you guys get to know who Jesus Christ is. So I'm going to pray with you. And like I said, if you want to talk, if you want to pray, whatever you want, come grab one of us. We're here for you. If you could bow your heads. Heavenly Father, God, you are so good. You are so good. You are the creator of the universe. And you want a relationship with us. How how awesome is that? God, that you took a broken kid like me and gave me new life. Not because I deserve it. Nobody does. But because you are love. You are love. And Lord, I pray that you would open up the gates of heaven tonight. And that your spirit would fall on each and every one of us tonight, Lord. Because where your spirit is, there is freedom. Freedom from the chains of our sins. Freedom from alcohol. Freedom from addiction. Freedom from suicide. Freedom from the brokenness and pain and hopelessness that weighs on our hearts. Lord, making a decision to come to you is a life decision. It is the only decision that will ever truly matter in this life more than anything else. I can't imagine my life without you, Lord, because I wouldn't have any life. Father, speak to their hearts. That your voice would be louder than any other voice, Lord, that's speaking to them now. That we bind the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. These are God's children. He's chosen them. Lord, let your love fall on each and every one of them, that they would know your love. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. And we pray this in your most holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Sure.